Welcome to My French Web Radio, the radio of the Alliance Française of Malaysia, based in KL and Penang. Today, you're listening to an episode of the program Five Questions to Cinq Questions à. Enjoy! Hello, everyone. Buenos dias, Carlos Andres Mejia. Buenos Bonjour, dia. Maya Darmé. Bonjour. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me and our online audiences today. I know you've had a very busy schedule since you arrived in Malaysia last week, uh, so it's greatly appreciated. In fact, for this unique episode of the Alliance Française of Malaysia's web radio, we welcome two guests who have traveled a long way to join me on the stage of the Alliance Française de Kuala Lumpur today. I'm talking with two internationally renowned artists, Maya Darmé, French harpist and globetrotter, we can say that, as well as Carlos Andres Mejia, Colombian conductor, pianist, composer, and I have read that you were uh, directing the Philharmonic Orchestra of the Dominican Republic, but I'm not, I'm not sure if it's still yeah, up yeah, to yeah. date. I, okay. I used to be, yeah, perfect. Okay. Ah, you used, used to be. Used to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're in Malaysia because you performed uh, last Saturday Solstice Lunaire uh, at the Asia Europe Institute in uh, University Malaya. And that was uh, part of the French Film Festival 2022. And so I took this occasion to uh, invite you to for an interview today. Um, and once again, thank you very much. Gracias, merci. <coughs> So to begin this interview, um, very broad first question. You both have a very rich professional and musical background. So could you tell us very briefly where you stand nowadays? Maybe we can start with Maya first. Right, I'm a harpist. I play the harp and I was classically trained. So um, I play the big pedal harp that you usually see at the very back of the orchestras. But my job as a soloist is to actually put the harp at the front of the stage and to play harp concertos uh, accompanied with orchestras. Um, other than that, I play a lot of world music on uh, a variety of smaller harps. And I play the electric harp in rock and electro bands. And I travel a lot, yeah. <laughs> and you, Carlos, so I mentioned you are also a pianist uh, and a conductor. And how, how did you decide to become a conductor? What's your, what's your, your background? Well, uh, I began my studies in Manizales, in Colombia. It's a small city in the center of the city. And in the very, very beginning, I was not thinking at all uh, to become a conductor, actually. More piano, uh, performer and and composer but then i got an opportunity with a friend that was conducting a choir uh, like to get together one group of people that were singing in a in one part of the city and some other students of another university different of the one that i was studying in and then i got the opportunity to 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 try myself into put all those uh, musical wishes together and it was like my first time conducting an orchestra back in 2003 like 19 years <laughs> wow. ago already but yeah but frankly it was not in my initial plans when i was beginning to study like seriously music uh, yeah so then afterwards when i was i was studying in venezuela my master degree and then i was just almost just conducting almost very very few piano and composing and then actually after many years I was like resuming my piano playing again in the pandemic times actually and yeah that's it super wow yeah. um so to come back to you Maya so you mentioned you're a harpist it's a very unique instrument that's quite rare also to yeah. see on on stage um and it's unique both by its aesthetic uh but also how it sounds um, and you mentioned that you also play electronic harp. Mm -hmm. So my question was, um, what are the latest developments in harp playing? Uh, because it's a very um, yeah, classical instrument, but you mentioned ro rock music, world, world music. Um, how can you explain 
can you explain a little bit the latest developments? That's a very good question. Yes, the harp itself uh, dates all the way back from prehistory. We've actually found some harps on all continents uh, developed more or less at the same time uh, from when uh, hunters with bows started to realize in all different civilizations that when you when you use a bow it makes a sound every time the string uh, vibrates so people started adding more strings um, but with that being said the harp that we see today the classical harp it's a very recent instrument it was developed at the beginning of the 19th century mm. because it has a mechanism of pedals that is actually extremely complex there's 2,000 tiny little pieces um, that it's things that we don't know how to make. And also there's a lot of tension. There's more than one ton of tension from the strings. So it's very complex uh, wood making. Um, and from then on, from the invention of this pedal mechanism onwards, the harp has never changed, uh, has never stopped changing. So we keep on building it, developing it, trying to make it bigger, because at least for me in, in my role as a soloist, um, it's, the main challenge often is to make sure that the harp, with one harp, I can sound louder than a whole orchestra with, I don't know, 20 violins and, and brass sections and winds and percussions. So we're always trying to make the harp bigger so that more sound uh, resonates and the sound can project more in the room. Um, but in recent years, uh, I'd say in the last 20 years, um, there has been a lot of developments toward the electric harp, which works uh, um, pretty much like an electric guitar in the in the sense that it it is a solid body instrument. So if you don't plug it in, uh, it doesn't really make any sound. Um, and it has a microphone on each string, a small pickup microphone. And the idea is that you don't play it pure, but you add effect pedals, exactly the same pedals that you would put on a guitar or a bass, distortion, overdrive, fuzz, uh, you name it, reverb. And the really the harp just is a tool to create um, to yeah uh, to create a sound signal. Um, I play the electric harp because the harp is the instrument that I know better, but in a way I could use the electric harp in the same way that I would use an electric guitar. And uh, there's also MIDI harps. There's only two of them in the world um, because I guess since we have MIDI keyboard, the interest of having a MIDI harp is just really for harpists, uh, and that's a very niche market. Um, but it works exactly the same than a MIDI keyboard as well. Like one string, when you plug it, it mm. will uh, launch a MIDI sample, whatever you want it to be, and um, you can, yeah, you you get it directly into a DAW interface and. Interesting. Change the sound however you want to change it. Um, this all this is very important for us harpists because um, as we expand the harp's repertoire outside of the classical world, we have to play on larger stages with instruments that are very loud or instruments that are uh, all electric, and and amplifying the harp is a real challenge because the sounds uh, leaves from everywhere, and the best way of um, of getting a good sound is to put the microphones a bit further away but if you do that on a large, large stage where you have drums where you have you're going to pick up all the instruments um, so it's very useful for me in when I don't play um, classical music to be able to have an electric instrument uh, with uh, the sound that is coming out of it directly from a jack like a, an electric guitar I see wow so many possibilities. Yeah, it opens <laughs> a whole world. And um, and then for traditional instruments, uh, there's there's just a wealth of harps. Um, we were talking about Latin America. Um, the harp there is really famous. It's pretty much the national instrument in Venezuela, in Paraguay. In There's also a lot of harps in Mexico, in, uh, in Colombia. And they all have slightly different shapes. And they're... All the traditional harps are smaller than the big classical harp, um, but they have their specific sound and they're extremely interesting for me to tackle. There's also a million African harps. There's oh, so wow. much, <laughs> so many instruments. Many harps still uh, left to explore. I guess. Oh, so many. My collection <laughs> is already way too big because <laughs> they 
they take a lot of space, <laughs> but there's always more. <laughs> yeah, it's not like ukulele or <laughs> no. Unfortunately, everyone always tells me, "Why don't you wish you played the flute? Or where didn't you pick the triangle?" <laughs> But, and it's very true, but it's not as fun. <laughs> but it's beautiful objects as well. I mean, uh, it's quite <laughs> impressive. It is actually. Um, on the, I was talking about how hard it is, uh, like the woodwork on the harp. It, it's actually, yeah, it's a, it's a very um, technical craft and it's beautiful uh, artisanship. Mm. Um, and there are not so many classical harp makers in the world and it's it's really yeah something it takes up to three years to make a, a classical harp and it's it's a very complex task so yeah. yeah it's a beautiful object in itself very very interesting to learn about the midi harp also i never <laughs> yes. heard of uh, such a thing but uh, <laughs> now I, I will look for one of the two <laughs> So, uh, Carlos, uh, I didn't mention it, but you composed uh, Solstice Lunaire, so the, um, one of the, 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 the plays that were programmed uh, last Saturday. And you composed it f also for Maya in some way. Um, I was wondering about the connection that uh, appears between a composer and a musician and an instrument also. Um, how does that work? And how can you compose with someone in mind or a specific uh, instrument in, in your head? I'm, I'm wondering about the creative process. C yeah. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, for this occasion, it was absolutely uh, linked uh, with the fact that I had the opportunity to make the concert uh, with Maya and on May 2019 that it was a concert with the um, uh, the French embassy in Santo Domingo. It was a whole French repertoire, wonderful music. And uh, I think, and I am not mistaken when I'm saying so, it was the concert where I was like conducting more harp music in my life. Because <laughs> one thing that she was mentioning before is one thing is to have the harp as a you know, like a one piece of the puzzle of the entire orchestra, but mm. another different is to have like the harp as a soloist. Mm. And in that occasion, as we had on Saturday, we were making two different uh, solo harp pieces with orchestra accompaniment. Oh, that's very rare. I need to jump in and say, because uh, concertos are so hard to play. It's usually half an hour, more or less, or 25 minutes to half an hour. And it's the, pi the pinnacle of uh, virtuosity in classical music. So usually a soloist would only play one because you're, you're pretty much dead after that. I so see. it's a rare opportunity and luxury and chance to have two of them programmed in the same concert. Oh, For wow. me as a musician, it's a challenge, but it's also great because then I can show the audience two very different uh, facets of the harp. And that's what we had done in Santo Domingo. We had like... Uh, a concerto by a classical uh, French composer and a, a concerto by Debussy, so more impressionist mm. in aesthetic. I see. I'm, um, I have to, to say we, you, you have to leave soon because uh, you have a plane to catch, so mm, yeah. if you can tell us quickly about... <laughs> yeah. uh, so basically uh, I was very impressed by the way of uh, the performance that Maya was having that I like it so much. Well, and. And I have to say that since years before getting to, to play with Maya, I, I was already writing little parts for harp, but not a harp concerto. So I, I, I saw a wonderful opportunity and she was helping me with all the technical demanding things and the specific things of the harp, because as you can imagine, it's not the same thing to compose for a piano than for a harp, for the nature of the, of the sound itself, the way that has to be played, uh, many, many technical uh, um, not only limitations, but possibilities that the harp has that the piano mm. doesn't. So uh, I had a lot to learn and it, uh, without her would be would have been impossible. And then, yeah, and many things uh, related with the content of the concert as well. It was just like the inspiration that she gave me in the way that she's playing the instrument. So for, for some, for many reasons, uh, counting with those, it was quite easy for me to making uh, such a task with her help so it was a pleasure actually for me okay uh, very collaborative in absolutely the mm -hmm. it's a lot it's always whenever i work with a contemporary composer uh the harp is 
is an instrument that is not so well known in its capacity and it, in its limitations, uh, especially for extended techniques, so the uh, unusual ways to play it. So it's always a lot of workshopping with composers and it's a lot of background research also on their part. Like I would send them lots of scores, lots of recordings, lots of me playing different techniques and they listen to all of that and they see how that inspires them, <coughs> what is good writing for the harp, what is some examples of I would say bad writing, but writing that doesn't sound as the composer might have intended. Um, and okay. yeah, it's it's always back and forth. He would send me a page, I'd record it, he would edit it, we would, yeah. Mm. Carlos, I had one last question for yeah. you, but I guess uh, I will direct it to Maya because I see someone in the back who's telling me that you have to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm very sorry, but no. uh, it was a pleasure to no, have you, you with much. us. Thank you very much. my pleasure. And uh, if I come to Colombia one day... Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Let's keep in touch. Definitely. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure. Safe travel. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> So we lost one uh, one artist, but Maya is still here and uh, she will be able to share a lot more also yeah. with us. So no problem with this. Um, so my next question was actually directed towards you, Maya. Um, we saw you sing during the <laughs> performance uh, of Solstice Lunaire. And I was wondering, do you practice singing? Um, if yes, is it on a professional, in a professional mm -hmm. way. Uh, because I'm asking this question because you were actually, I'm trying to explain to the, the audience, you were um, hiding, kind of hiding behind your harp. Mm -hmm. uh, at the very beginning, I thought there was a technical problem with your harp. <laughs> and then you started singing and I understood, I mean, the way I interpreted it was that you gave a voice to the harp. The, yeah. the harp was singing. Mm -mm. and. Also, my uh, reading was that you were a bit shy and you did, <laughs> no. you're a harpist and so you don't want to sing in public. Oh. That was my, inter my second interpretation. So I was wondering what's, what's the, the truth. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, so that was during the second movement of the concerto, which is the more uh, contemporary in writing. The first movement is quite classical in its writing. It follows a sonata form, so it's uh, very... Uh, easily recognizable uh, form in classical music. The second movement is programmatic music. So it tells a story and it tells the story of Siddhartha by the German mm. Hermann Hesse. And Siddhartha was a uh, Buddha and oh, Carlos would be better suited to tell you everything. But um, basically Siddhartha had a, an insane life. He, he had many lives in once. He, in one, he was once uh, an errand monk. Then he fell in love with the a very rich and powerful woman. He had a son. He did a bunch of things in his life. So, <laughs> so Siddhartha had an insane life. And the second movement is telling his life. So there are many different episodes from his life. Um, there are one moment we hear the rain from all the shrinks that becomes a tempest. And then we have the harp making sound effects with a metal bit that mm. so it sounds a bit like sliding. And that's every time he has an illumination. Uh, so the whole concerto was planned around the theme of light. Uh, from the the first movement was the sun coming out, um, with all <laughs> with like many explanations behind that. The second movement is interior life, interior light. Sorry, finding uh, spiritual spiritual enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And the third movement is a Colombian cumbia, a dance that traditionally was danced by um, the slaves who were brought to, Colum to Colombia to work in plantations and at night were doing rituals, danced rituals in the barracks with all the men being chained and the women, one woman had a, a, a candle and with that she was trying to um, keep them away from her but in a very seductive way so that's like the candle, the light. But for the second movement when I start singing um, it is a very spiritual moment and it's uh, echoes from the past that he hears when he's uh, on top of this mountain with um, a tempest, with uh, we hear a lot of insects buzzing and, and the voice from all his past lessons learned from his different lives. And, um, so the idea was that I would hide 
because I give a voice to the harp to start with, but also on a very practical level because the harp has holes at the back. And when I sing into um, the, the sounding table of the harp, then it gets amplified. Um, so I actually am singing into the holes. Mm. <laughs> uh, and for that, I need to balance the harp um, in a way contrary to how it is usually balanced. So the harp is never standing on the ground. Whenever I play it, I'm actually balancing it on two of its feet. It has four feet, and I'm balancing it on two of them, the two back ones. And to sing, to have access to the holes, I need to balance on to balance it on the two front ones. So yeah, I need to kind of tip over the harp, which is always a bit... I think, impressive and scary for the audience, especially for the harpist who runs the harp for the concert, <laughs> <laughs> usually. Um, and, and then I, yep, I, I try to sing as loud as I can <coughs> be heard behind, in front of the orchestra. So you were not hiding. <laughs> I was not hiding and I, I love singing. I actually, I started, I started off as a singer. Okay. I um, started off playing in, um, not singing, sorry, in the opera choir, because they often need uh, kids. So that's how I'm. That was my first job. That's how I made money okay. when I was young. Um, but I, I don't know if I would call myself a professional singer now because I, I haven't had many opportunities to sing classical lyrically uh, for for a while. I've sung more like world music and pop, okay um, things. Mm. But yeah. I do love to sing. <laughs> Super. Okay. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> thank you. But Everything that was Carlos. Carlos's idea. <laughs> okay. And I wasn't too sure about it when he was like mm, how about you sing during the concerto <laughs> it's very unusual um so that the question was uh, the last question was addressed to carlos but mm -hmm. i think you can uh, really uh, answer it as well because um you've been traveling a lot and this applies to other uh, uh performances you must have had in the past i was wondering how It, it feels to come in a new country, mm. uh, arrive and directly start to rehearse on a very short period of time. Mm -mm. Um, and Carlos uh, actually composed this uh, this Solstice Lunaire piece. So it's I guess it's even more intimate for him to mm -hmm. share uh, this uh, this piece with a new ensemble. Mm -mm. Uh, so you performed with Camerata Kiel uh, on Saturday. So um, how, how does it work? Uh, what do you get out of this like very very short but I guess very intense connection with new musicians and performers? That is such a good question. Um, first of all, it kind of comes with a territory of being a soloist, so I could not play several times with the same orchestra because an orchestra could not program uh, three harp concertos in a year. You, you want variety when you program for an orchestra. Mm. So I do always travel to play with different orchestras. Um, that being said, it is always um how could i say it it's extremely exciting and it's ex extremely scary at the f f at the same time the f i would say for me the most stressful is always the first rehearsal with an orchestra um because you do have extremely little time to get to know them and to be accepted by them and to build um enough of a, a synergy that you would want to produce something beautiful together and and it's a bit the same for the guest conductor you have to um um to get the orchestra to respect you and you have to build a relationship and uh be able to share your musical ideas and and um have this uh 60 person uh band <laughs> react to your ideas um, but you were asking about the number of rehearsals it is uh, it's always very short because an orchestra costs, it costs a lot of money <laughs> really so you never get like 10 rehearsals with an orchestra that's unheard of so four is pretty standard The, we had four rehearsals to prepare this concert um, but it is always you're always running after time and it is a big part of the conductor's job to manage time during the rehearsals and to make sure that even though um, nothing is perfect <laughs> in the first go on one piece you have to move to the next one because you yeah every minute counts and um And no one is late at an orchestra rehearsal. It's really, if it starts at seven, at seven, everyone is already warmed up, tuned, sat, ready to play. Uh, just because it's such a, time is such a, uh, of so much of the essence. Um, uh, 
And the last thing that I should say is that I've played this concerto with other conductors than Carlos um, because I've, <laughs> I've had to sometimes, but it is absolutely hon an honor to be able to play it with the conductor because yes, he has so much. He's very clear, obviously it's his ideas, so he knows uh, very well what is important for him um, and uh, what sound he wants to get from the orchestra, what tempi he wants and um, and of course he's able to uh, tell the orchestra where the ID comes from and so um, uh, give them the background into the music and that makes absolutely all the difference. Uh, I guess you must have the, the raw material uh, straight from the source, I mean straight from it Carlos's is, and mind. And it is so, so much easier for me than when I have to um, play it with an orchestra where I am the sole representative. And I have to explain everything, you know, explain maybe the cumbia, explain why he wanted a forte from the clarinets in this specific moment, what it means, what it... So it's, it's a lot less pressure for me, <laughs> definitely <laughs> when I have him there, <laughs> than when I have to explain to another conductor what he wanted and, and to make sure that I defend his ideas. Because every musician, every conductor is going to have his own... Interpretation. Uh, interpretation mm -hmm. and ideas. And sometimes it's great, but sometimes it... It's really not what the composer meant, and so you always have to you always have to compromise anyway between the soloist and the conductor, because uh, yeah, it's like two uh, subjectivity. It's Absolutely, uh, and, yeah. and like very equal. Like there's there's a very clear hierarchy in an orchestra, but between the conductor and the soloist, it's like two equal forces that need to team up and and agree <laughs> on things. Because uh, if as a soloist I want to play slower and the conductor is trying to get faster, it's not going to work. The, <laughs> the orchestra will have to follow one of them. And uh, yeah, so oh, wow. compromise. It's like a battlefield. <laughs> it is. Sometimes, <laughs> hopefully it shouldn't be, but it can be. And it's uh, that's why it's so important to um, to play with a conductor with who you can have uh, an open discussion, uh, a friendly relationship, and, and agree on, on everything, yeah. I see. Mm. Super. Well, thank you very much, Maya. Uh, and thank you, Carlos. Uh, <laughs> yes. Even if you left already. Um, so, very, very last question. So, you're going back to France uh, in a few days, on Friday. Yeah. Yes. And so, what's next for you? What, uh, what are your next big projects? Oh, as many concerts as possible this summer. We're finally opening to concerts again. Um, the first thing I'm going to do when I come back to France is uh, a little tour with a world music band called Harkan. Um, that I founded with a canoon player, which is a type of uh, oriental, um, I guess it's, it's like a harp, but uh, horizontal harp. So you put it on your lap and you play horizontally instead of playing vertically. And a uh, percussionist uh, from Kurdistan. Um, so we play our own compositions, but we also play uh, our arrangements from traditional melodies from the whole region. So it's a very different <laughs> and very jazz influenced. Um, so we're going on tour in France and the UK with that. Um, Super. That's be my first project. And then a lot of uh, classical concerts this summer as well. Okay. Yeah. Super. Well, good luck with everything. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And hopefully uh, we'll see you again in Malaysia at one point or another I with a new piece. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we have to get Carlos to write another piece. <laughs> <laughs> Send him a message right Exactly. Now. <laughs> in the plane. You will have lots of time. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Maya. Thank you very much. Um, I take this opportunity to also thank the University Malaya, uh, the Asia Europe Institute for making this concert possible because it took place in their venue and also of course a very big thank you to Camerata KL and all the musicians who joined for this uh, concert and for their warm welcome we had a wonderful time Terry Makati merci beaucoup thank you for listening if you had a good time and want to listen to more podcasts don't hesitate to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or visit our website www.alliancefrancaise.org.my.